Hi, this is Brian Fields, amateur radio call sign W9CR. And today I have a continuation of some research that uh, was done into kind of the two meter band, uh, specifically in Florida, why it's a little uh, strangely laid out for, uh, well, repeaters, sub bands, the way things are uh, and, and currently allocated on it. <clears throat> so I have a kind of my standard presentation that I wouldn't say standard, but it's, it's kind of my format that I use. Uh, there's a lot of text, uh, some animations and so forth in here, just trying to convey the, the basics of it. And anyways, um, <clears throat> this is uh, essentially the two meter band history in Florida, why things are the way they are. Uh, why repeaters are allocated the way that they are. And I don't think anybody's done this sort of uh, putting this together before. So uh, this grew out of a research project called a historical view of VHF coordination. And essentially two meters is a bit disjointed. So you have uh, 20 kilohertz below 146 uh, in terms of channel spacing. 15 kilohertz above, uh, and these are all wideband channels. Um, 600 kilohertz TX RX split everywhere on two meters. That seems to be pretty universal. Um, and then you have the offsets are strange. You have negative below 147 megahertz and positive above 147. Uh, simplex is in between both repeaters at 146 and 147. Uh, packet for some reason at 145. And then there's some other strange issues in terms of like the new Oscar subband, uh, the experimental, and there's even some channels uh, in the FASMA band plan that are just undefined. So, <clears throat> excuse me. This spawned uh, a research project, and I thought this was going to be a very small research project to figure out, okay, why is VHF, uh, specifically two meters in amateur radio, so strange? And my background, seeing commercial two-way and how that is allocated, says, well, it's probably grown out of, grown out of that. So uh, there's this research uh, paper I put together. Uh, it has all the references. None of the references are going to be in this presentation. Uh, so please refer to the paper for that. If you believe something's incorrect, please email me with sources, and I will get it corrected. Um, uh, this is, uh, in this, applies to general radio history, and specifically as it applies to what we're doing here in Florida. Uh, it's generally applicable to the rest of ham radio, I think, but I I'm writing it from the FASMA perspective and what we're doing here. So uh, what's really cool about this presentation and really the research it's based off of uh, we dug through, and, and mostly me, dug through all the references and source material to actually co corrob corroborate, uh, to verify what's out there. Um, and I don't, I don't think anybody's really put that together before. I, I have a lot of anecdotal evidence, a lot of, well, this is the way I remember it being. Uh, but none of that really pulled together uh, in a way that, that has references to back up uh, what you know claims are being made, uh, which I think is very important for understanding where we're going in amateur radio. So uh, I have divided this into history and going over the first uh, kind of one-way radio, uh, birth of F -F -F FM, creation of the FCC, uh, then talking about early FM radio, uh, probably the big thing here is the Connecticut VHF system uh, from a commercial standpoint. One of the first uses of uh, FM, VHF FM in a big way, early amateur operations, and then World War II, which kind of stalled amateur radio for a long time. Um, and then finally, our post-World War II stuff. So that's the growth for FM. Um, the uh, repeater regulations, the FM wars, uh, 
um, and narrowband 1.0, narrowband 2.0, uh, and uh, uh, narrowband 2.0 is probably what we all know is what we consider narrowband today, but it's, it's really the second time for the FCC doing it to commercial radio. <clears throat> and then finally, looking forward. Um, and keep in mind, there's a lot of background here in terms of commercial regulation that drove <coughs> what we do as amateur radio operators. Uh, I also apologize. I have had COVID. I have had the flu. I have had RSV. Uh, it has not been a great uh, winter for me. So if I have a little cough, uh, that's what it is. Uh, there's a little bit of gravel in my voice still. Mm. <clears throat> But so history of two-way radio, uh, and th this is kind of actually really cool uh, because we have the first regulation of radio really happening with the Ra Radio Act in 1912, um, <coughs> and this is basically the ratification of the uh, International uh, Radio Telegraph Convention, and had uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Um, and it had uh, no provisions for broadcast or really for land use. This was, we get a radio on a ship so that people can uh, send SOS messages and things like that. That was the only use of radio intended by the, uh, uh, the International Radio Telegraph uh, uh, Treaty. So the director at the time had issues um, with this. Uh, there was no real way for the, the, uh, uh, the organization here uh, under the Radio Act to technically set standards other than what was in the Act. So, you know, if a new standard came out, Congress was involved in it. Uh, so this was eventually scrapped for the Federal Radio, Com uh, Radio Commission, the predecessor of the FCC in 1927. So 1927, uh, AM broadcasting boomed. Uh, that was still under separate um, jurisdiction, really. Uh, amateurs were relegated, uh, regulated to above two megahertz. Um, <clears throat> and there was no provision for two way or even public safety radio. Uh, but, uh, entrepreneurial or enterprising, uh, two way, uh, pioneers and one way pioneers got around that. So the way this happened is you had people that said, well, let's just start up a broadcast station, play music. And instead of funding it with commercials or, you know, announcements, things like that, we'll have announcements to the squad cars. And the squad cars can have an AM radio and they'll hear, you know, music or whatever, uh, classic popular music of the day, whatever, um, coming through their radio. And then they can get dispatched. So this way you had call outs to, to that and everybody got to hear it, and they also got a essentially advertisement-free radio station out of it. Uh, this grew into many uh, cities, and it was still one way, so your police car had to go out there and pick up a, uh, you know, a call box to radio, or not radio, but to call back in over a landline and say, hey, what's going on? Uh, yeah, we're out there, we're on our way, we're dispatching, but this got the police outside of their you know, their barracks outside of their, uh, their station out into the environment. And so long as they could hear the radio and, and monitor it, they could dispatch themselves very quickly. Uh, and this was a huge improvement uh, for police officers of the day. <clears throat> so one way really proved itself here. And <clears throat> the, uh, the FRC uh, actually established a band right above the AM broadcast band. Um, <clears throat> uh, with about a dozen channels. That was, that was 1930. Uh, so these first systems were all homebrew. They were all modified by the police departments, uh, had few standards, worse stability. Uh, crystals were not uh, even really a thing. It was standard, you know, VFO type oscillators. Um, and no ability to return traffic other than by this call box on the side of the road. Still, a great improvement. The other real problem, AM does not scale in dense cities. Um, so, uh, plus then you have the interference from early uh, 
automobiles, uh, which are essentially spark gap transmitters driving around with uh, an AM receiver. Uh, and in many cases, the transmitter was just simply thrown on top of the police department, not in a choice location in many cities. So the FCC came along in 1927. They take over from the FRC, and they established this UHF public safety band at 30 to 40 megahertz. Uh, Bayonne, New Jersey became one of the first users with the return AM path. So they're still using broadcast radio, essentially. But now somebody in the car can pick up and say, hey, I have uh, uh, on my, my AM radio uh, return path at 31 megahertz. Yeah, I've got it. I'm on my way. I don't have to pull over, find a police call box, and call it in. The equipment for this was just simply humongous. Uh, extra car batteries, and they were having to charge them after every shift. Uh, the alternators, and they didn't have alternators. You had uh, generators uh, at the time were just incapable of maintaining the load needed for this. Uh, however, this did bring out some of the first commercially available two-way radio equipment. So you had Bosch, Spartan, RCA, GE, uh, FM, Link, and Galvin, which a lot of people recognize as uh, what's now known as Motorola, kind of replacing this homebrew gear. So there, there's some good standardization finally happening there. Uh, however, it was not uncommon for each department to have its own system doing its own thing with its own standards. Uh, not too terribly different from how things really were in, in a lot of police departments uh, up until the whole push for interoperability in the last probably 15 years or so. <clears throat> so here's some pictures of this. Uh, this is actually the control point of uh, KOP in Detroit. Um, this is the you know phones, people calling in, dispatch and then you know record players essentially for the music uh, behind uh, I thought it was pretty cool to find this I mean it's set up uh, essentially in a, in a tent um, here's one of the setups in the uh, uh, the patrol car and keep in mind this is Detroit so these guys are pretty cold uh, I would imagine riding around in this thing uh, and then finally, uh, some of the uh, equipment that would be in the trunk, uh, enabling the receivers and transmitters for the, uh, the return path stuff for 31 megahertz. Uh, now, the first part is this early FM radio getting into FM two-way. Uh, and a lot of this is going to shape what happens in amateur radio. <clears throat> so... Uh, kind of this revolution in two-way is FM. And I know I put it out here, Armstrong didn't invent FM. There's a lot of people who will say he did. But what he did was popularize wideband FM, not narrowband FM. Um, and his contribution was essentially all the circuits necessary for this to work. He had patents on everything, but he was most interested in the broadcast use. And... Uh, uh, he battled RCA until, unfortunately, uh, he committed suicide, uh, jumping out of a building from the stress of the legal battle. Um, uh, interestingly, Galvin Manufacturing, uh, also known as now Motorola, took note of the success of it um, uh, after its first use by uh, da this uh, Daniel uh, Nobel in uh, the Connecticut State Police. And Mr. Noble was actually an uh, amateur radio operator. Uh, was licensed. Uh, he was IEEE fellow. Uh, did a lot of uh, a lot of pioneering work in this, uh, not just in civilian but also in military applications. Uh, but this goes across what he did for the Connecticut State Police, which was kind of this this first big system that uh, worked very well. So one other interesting thing to me here in, in doing the research was. Uh, GE General Electric licensed the Armstrong patents for FM for all their two-way stuff. Um, but Motorola fought this tooth and nail, uh, eventually losing in, in 1967. It took a long time. I just think it's interesting because Motorola is probably the standout in the two-way radio business for you know, being serious about intellectual property and things like that. And... Uh, <laughs> it, I think maybe they're more serious about their intellectual property than, uh, than that of others. So, uh, but Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Armstrong, his widow, uh, did, uh, did very well uh, uh, eventually in courts, uh, uh, 
pretty much, I think she won every single suit that was brought. <clears throat> so the first FM system, uh, and the first one at scale was this Connecticut State Police system. And the FCC established uh, ranges above 30 megahertz, um, VHF high, what we would call now 150 to 162 and 450 to 470 for public safety use. <clears throat> Commercial users were not really given too much of a thought at this point. Uh, public safety was was the main user, along with uh, kind of forestry and, and power companies uh, were some of the ideas of it. Basically, anything relating to utility. Um, this established a lot of engineering practices that really analog systems still use to this day and, and up through the 90s. Um, the system was, was simplex, no repeaters. Repeaters weren't even a thing at the time. Uh, however, it did use a split frequency between the base stations and the mobile stations. So one of the most revolutionary things that Mr. Noble did in designing this was put the base station up on the hills. Um, I wouldn't say Connecticut has mountains, but put them up high, give them good antennas, and then link everything back with a four wire phone line back to dispatch. So there's really no reason for repeaters because dispatch can hear everybody and everybody talks through dispatch. So the other thing, it was all crystal controlled. These early systems really did have poor stability, uh, especially in non-temperature controlled environments. Uh, so this also took advantage of the capture effect of FM, allowing frequency reuse between these different sites. <clears throat> So a couple of takeaways from this is you had this practical antenna size for vehicles. Uh, a quarter wave antenna was you know, seven feet long or two meters. Uh, again, this was low, low band. It wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, VHF high at the time, but it was still wide band FM. Um, greatly reduced uh, this ignition noise problem. I think I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, you're, uh, gasoline powered vehicles of the day were just spark transmitters. They, nothing like the uh, what we have today with coil packs and things like that. Um, <clears throat> no long wave propagation at night. Uh, again, going from the AM band to this, uh, AM broadcast band, I should say, to this. Tons more channels. Uh, the big thing was vacuum tube type equipment could be run outside the linear portion of it because FM doesn't need to be linear. Uh, so you have gained uh, a lot more on receive, you gained more transmit power, and the receiver audio was nice and consistent, the same way that FM is today. Even on a noisy signal, the audio doesn't go down like this. It stays nice and loud, uh, even if there is a lot of noise on it. Uh, wideband FM does have a little bit less noise than uh, 5 kilohertz deviation FM. So... The early FM, what were the regulations? Uh, well, initially there weren't any. <laughs> um, 150 megahertz used uh, 60 kilohertz channels, uh, went for a 42 kilohertz wide signal. <coughs> and I say 42 kilohertz plus. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the deviation was uh, poorly controlled. It was anywhere from 15 to 40 kilohertz of deviation. Um, crystals were all natural. Uh, in, again, we didn't have synthetic quartz uh, really until the 1950s, uh, and that was a, a huge development. So the only quartz you could get was out of a mine somewhere in Brazil or certain areas of Europe. And there was no high, that should actually be no low pass filter, uh, Typically, you have a, a low-pass filter uh, for audio into the transmitter, limiting it to 3 kilohertz. Uh, there was none of that on the transmitter at the time. So the good thing is the carbon mics of the day that they used really had an issue getting above 4 or 5 kilohertz. So that limited it kind of naturally. Um, you had poor sensitivity and poor selectivity. Uh, the tuning range of the radio was very, very limited. Uh, all your channels had to be within... 250, 300, and kilo, uh, 300 kilohertz or so of each other, uh, or the radio strip would, you know, the receiver, the transmitter would just go out of tune. Um, and IF filtering was, again, not very good because you didn't have crystal filters uh, in the IF yet. Uh, that would come along later. Uh, the idea of 
being able to just go and go to Murata and purchase a, a 455 kilohertz uh, IF filter, uh, that, that was years away. Um, the also the early radio kit occupied the entire trunk and you know if you left it on and shut the car off it would just drain the battery um, <clears throat> and the one thing I, I will show here is uh, if you look up at the top here uh, at uh, over here you'll see hey here's a 60 kilohertz channel here's a 42 kilohertz wide uh, signal uh, thereabouts is what it should be so we start looking into the first amateur operations and the first amateur UHF privileges was really anything above 30 megahertz. Uh, that's what UHF was at the day. So this eventually became the five, uh, two and a quarter, um, and one and a, one and one quarter uh, bands. Uh, and you'll see that these bands are way different than what we have today. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this was after being proposed by the ARRL. So we had uh, you know, basically all operation was VFO based and stations would call CQ for uh, many, uh, many minutes while the other person dialed them in. Uh, around 1938, you had new regulations and cost reductions uh, brought crystal control into the mainstream. Output power was still low, and essentially all hams made everything in-house. In uh, again, no such things as channels existed. It was simply ranges. <clears throat> uh, AWRL actually organized a five-meter relay stations for message passing. Uh, I believe it was mostly in the Northeast, uh, but uh, it, it was used, and I, I do recall reading this in QST. It was, it was kind of an interesting thing. Uh, I can simply find no records of amateur FM activity at this point. Uh, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but I can't find it. <clears throat> so, uh, World War II, uh, amateur radio just is paused. Uh, as I, I think I said here, total war comes to America. Um, I, th I think that's kind of what von Clausewitz said, or maybe it was absolute war. Uh, essentially, the entire nation is at war. Uh, this is uh, unique uh, in, in our history. And December 8th, 1941, FCC orders all amateur activity to cease. Uh, of course, the previous day, uh, the uh, Empire of Japan uh, bombed Pearl Harbor. The FCC had previously restricted all amateurs to only domestic contacts since 1940, though. So... Essentially, for the duration of the war, all non-defense radioactivity was prohibited. All broadcast license applications were put on hold. New public safety two-way licenses were severely curtailed. Uh, also, new equipment, and especially quartz crystals, were only for the war effort. Uh, I mentioned that you had to get natural quartz, and about the only place you could get it that was not in, well, occupied by... Uh, the, the access powers at the time was in Brazil, and that was a very strategic, important crystal uh, and, and you know, war material that we needed. Uh, so amateurs, of course, aren't going to be able to use that. So it wasn't really until late summer 1945, which is actually pretty quick after the war ended, that hams got any privileges back. Um, the civilian broadcast equipment, uh, both transmit and receive, was restricted until the fall of 1945. Uh, it was not available for purchase. Uh, licenses were not granted until uh, early 1946 and then started having the TV boom after that. So amateurs did step up in a big way and assist the war effort. Many enlisted or were drafted and specialized in communication services. Many who remained were engineers. There's a lot more professionals uh, in the engineering service that were also radio amateurs at the time. And some, or I should say many, also assisted via what was called WEIRS, or the uh, <clears throat> War Emergency Radio Service. Uh, this was at uh, two and a half meters, one and a quarter meters, in the 400 megahertz band. Uh, this was essentially all VFO controlled. It was all AM, and it was all low power. This was designed uh, to be all homebrew, 
uh, very, you know, there were standard designs, but it was licensed to a community. And it was licensed so that it was just for civil defense use. You'd get on, do your civil defense type, you know, uh, exercises, whatever, get off. There was no general rag chewing. Uh, you know, it wasn't you were licensed. It was the area you were in and you were supporting that. The Ares uh, is a direct descendant from this war emergency radio service, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but it did prove the VHF and higher bands um, <clears throat> for local communications for ham radio, uh, which is, uh, I think, revolutionary that people were able to build stable or halfway stable VFOs that worked all the way up on VHF and even UHF without crystal control, without phase lock loops, and worked semi-reliably. One cool thing that came out during the war was, uh, I won't say it's the first walkie-talkie, but it was the first FM VHF two-way walkie-talkie called the SCR 300. This is developed by Motorola, used all crystals um, with multiple channels in it, and it was all FM. It proved how well VHF FM works in a you know, military type environment. And of course, one of the designers on this happened to just be uh, now Daniel Nobel uh, working for Motorola. So victory, uh, hams get 235 megahertz uh, back or you know what we'd call the 220 band today immediately. Um, problem was most licenses were actually expired uh, because at the time they only last uh, or were only good for three years. Uh, and the FCC was not renewing them. Uh, but they were grandfathered for a time. Uh, just many people were at war, things like that. Uh, two and a half meters would only open a couple megahertz at first uh, as it was still used. Um, HF, uh, I think even 80 meters uh, on HF took three, four years after the war actually ended for hams to, to get portions of it uh, back and, and get the Navy and the military completely off of it. The big thing that happened for ham radio, and, and really radio in general, was this third Inter-American Radio Conference in Rio de Janeiro, uh, Brazil, in September of 1945. This radically changed VHF spectrum and UHF spectrum around the world. Um, it moved hams to their current allocations now, and it established uh, aviation with its own international band uh, at what was 2.5 meters, the, the old ham band. Uh, and this is how hams got their uh, two meters and got six meters and one and a quarter meters down to 220 and all that stuff. So uh, this is pretty cool. The one thing I will mention about this, I couldn't find anywhere the report, the, the actual uh, conference report on this. Uh, I could find bits and pieces. There's nothing in the National Archives from what I can find. If anybody has a a link to it or can provide it, I would really love to take a look at it. Uh, I, I think it would put a lot more color on, on other decisions that were made as well. <clears throat> so after World War II, we're going to see modern regulations for two-way radio, and this is also going to shape the two-meter band. So <clears throat> in 1940, there were really only a few thousand two-way licenses, uh, and by 1948, you had over 86,000. It's an exponential amount of two-way, just two-way growth. FM is the dominant mode on all licenses. There's still AM. It's still legal. Uh, there's a few people operating it, but FM is the clear winner, and it's what people are manufacturing commercial off-the-shelf equipment for. <clears throat> the state of the radio art is rapidly advancing, and this is one of the cool things about the FCC is they can actually make their own regulations under what Congress has empowered them to do. And the FCC at the time is very technical, legal, but very technical as well. Uh, they're not quite as technical today by, by a large margin. Uh, however, they're able to put regulations out there and say, hey, we're thinking of doing this, let's work forward on it and get input from the actual user base, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's a unique thing about the FCC uh, at the time in the federal government. <clears throat> so stability is still poor. Uh, under the 1943 rules that are in effect, you only needed 100 ppm stability, which is plus or minus 15 kilohertz at VHF. 
uh, selectivity is poor. You're talking 6 dB down, 50 kilohertz away. Uh, 200, 300 kilohertz uh, is your 60 dB point. FM really has no standards in terms of occup occupied bandwidth. Uh, so it's called the Carson bandwidth rule, but different manufacturers are making stuff all over the place. <clears throat> so stability under the current regulations. Uh, and if, if you see here, you have the, uh, the 60 kilohertz channel, assuming you're perfectly on frequency, here's where you're going to be. Well, if you look over here, you are off frequency, and that's kind of a bad thing. Uh, you can be plus or minus 15 kilohertz off. So it's, uh, it's to me, pretty interesting of how bad that can be. So <clears throat> 1953, uh, FCC puts in their first commercial regulations for FM. And they say, hey, nothing wider than 40 kilohertz can only do 15 kilohertz of deviation. So turn your deviation way down if you are running more than that. And then the max audio frequency you can have is three kilohertz. So you gotta have a low pass filter and you gotta have a limiter. Uh, so Carson bandwidth rule says, this is gonna be 36 kilohertz occupied bandwidth, worst case scenario with this, this setup. FCC says you got 40, uh, just in case uh, something is different. <clears throat> So they're also proposing a 50 ppm tolerance, and you can see that pulls things in a lot better. Uh, in, in this case, now we're actually fitting in our 60 kilohertz channel. However, 1955, they're saying, let's split this into 30 kilohertz channels. And yeah, it'll be technically a little bit of overlap, but it's FM, it doesn't occupy uh, that space all at the same time. Um, and even worst case scenario, you're only going to overlap and there's FM capture and things like that. So this is what we're talking about, which is the um, <clears throat> FM analog rolling off at the edges. So these 30 kilohertz channels work exceptionally well, uh, even though it's a little bit bigger. And the FCC will consider this the next time they decide to do this and say, well, it still fits. It's just a little bit bigger. Uh, we'll just take into account uh, that when we coordinate uh, adjacent channel users. <clears throat> now, by the same time period in the 1950s, they're predicting by 1960, you're going to have no more VHF high spectrum available uh, in, in many areas. I'm not talking the rural areas. I'm talking in your, your metropolitan areas. It's just not going to be there. And UHF is not so much a big thing at this point. So the FCC convenes a Joint Technical Assistance Community uh, Committee, JTAC. Um, this is industry experts, FCC engineers, and uh, yeah, the FCC had engineers. <laughs> At least back then they had engineers, uh, not just all lawyers like they are today. Um, proposed a limit of five kilohertz deviation. Still wide band, but it's significantly less. Uh, GE demonstrated this in 1949 to the FCC, and they're like, this sounds just as good as 15 kilohertz. Why do we need to occupy all this bandwidth? Big thing in 1950, 52, something like that, quartz is synthesized and is now being grown synthetically at scale for industry. So we don't need to rely on Brazil. We don't need to rely on anyone else. We can build it. Uh, we can actually get much higher quality quartz crystal uh, and we're knowing how to cut these things. Uh, this was actually a little company called uh, AT&T uh, that uh, designed this, uh, or well, the Bell Labs, Bell Labs uh, that did it for the Bell system or the phone company at the time. They needed quartz in almost everything they did for stability. Uh, in the same time, the TCXO was invented and basically standard across everything. So now you have five and two and a half uh, PPM stability, even in mobile stations, uh, base stations can do considerably better than that, uh, which is very amazing with, you know, you consider the time period this is in. Uh, we've just now, you know, by several orders of magnitude improved our stability. So the JTAC 
puts out their report 1955. Uh, this is puts out an NPRM, Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. They want comments. And essentially, they said, you know what? No new wideband gear can be sold after 1958. And anybody that's operating it, you got to shut down by 1963 and be totally re off the air. Uh, and, you know, migrated to narrowband FM, what we call wideband today. This is amazing because it's under three years from the NPRM to a ban and seven years to shut it down. This is so much faster. This is what we end up with. They split the channels again. Uh, and, you know, rather than maybe moving people to a... Because uh, people are going to have to replace all their equipment anyways or modify their equipment. Uh, rather than moving people to maybe a 20 kilohertz channel, they say, well, let's just split it again. It's analog. We just have this little orange area that overlaps, right? And, and yeah, the problem is it, it, this is how we got to our 15 kilohertz channels on, on really the ham band because we followed what they did on, uh, on commercial side. The problem with this, of course, is what we call this adjacent channel power ratio. And, you know, here's a, a diagram of it showing uh, one carrier in blue in the middle and then two adjacent carriers. And you can see there's a certain amount of power that comes through. So you have to take this really into account and look at your adjacent channels when you do coordinations. Selectivity matters greatly now. Uh, but the good thing is, is the quartz crystals are developed and quartz filters are developed uh, for uh, IF filtering, which significantly improves uh, selectivity in radios. <clears throat> so what's good for ham radio now is we have this birth of FM, all this early FM stuff that's out there for commercial has to be thrown out. It floods the market. Uh, the wide band radios come out in surplus in huge numbers by the mid sixties uh, and even early sixties, they come out. Uh, there's first generation lunchbox radios, second generation radios that are out there. Um, and importantly, in 1951, the FCC changed amateur licensing and created a technician class. Uh, this was just to be intended for experimentation, not communications use, and they got everything above 220. Uh, however, by 1959, right around this FM boom, techs get 145 to 147, which is really cool. Um, however, there's nothing in the actual FCC rules that says that techs can't talk to other people. Uh, this was initially floated as an idea as somebody that can help maintain those kind of war emergency radio service type things. They need access to the spectrum to transmit and test and do that stuff, but they're not going to be a communicator uh, like a ham radio person would be. However, it's just a different class of license. <clears throat> Internally in ham radio, this started uh, just a wonderful amount of gatekeeping again. I, I won't get into the details on it, but there were a lot of people ticked off when they figured out that techs could, under the law, legally talk to people uh, so long as they did it within the confines of their band plan. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of gnashing of teeth over the, the technician license by uh, the, the generals and whatnot at the time. So there's the first mention of FM in print uh, by a gentleman by the name of James uh, Aragard. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, K9 OJV. Uh, he was, I want to say he was in the Chicagoland area. And he wrote wrote some stuff for QST. Um, and then kind of the first repeaters came about. Uh, this first FM repeaters, I, I should say. Hams did have AM repeaters beforehand, but they were considerably different. So some of the really onerous licensing that happened for repeaters was the FCC required an application per repeater what frequency it was going to be or what frequency they can assign you. They would give you a separate call sign for that repeater, and you had to have full tape logging on it. You had to have remote control. You had to detail how the remote control was going to be done to the FCC. It was, it was pretty uh, impressive, and there were no real standards from what the FCC wanted to see. So it was basically people that had gone through it, writing articles on how to how to engineer your system and then how to submit to the FCC to get approval. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, they had 
some pretty interesting standards of the time uh, at the FCC. For some reason, though, they only allowed repeaters initially from 146 to 148 megahertz. I can't find any details on why that is. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping someone will know and, and have a, a reference as to why that is. Uh, but essentially, that's, that's the repeater band at the time. So uh, tube stations uh, with these you know, limited tuning ranges work really well for duplexing. Um, putting an in-band repeater together was unique to uh, an FM repeater, was unique to ham radio. Uh, it wasn't done on the commercial bands at all uh, because you, know, you had a remote base station, essentially, and everybody talked simplex. Uh, it really was not up until man, the, probably the 1990s that uh, non- public safety could even get a repeater approved from the FCC commercially for a two-way. Uh, and, and even then, public safety required a, you know, an exceptional showing as to why they needed an in-band VHF repeater. <clears throat> so there was a kind of a, an east-west divide here. Um, the other thing I will mention is the, the tube type equipment uh, made a lot less noise, a wideband noise because it would only work over a couple, you know, 100 kilohertz, and then all performance would drop off. So in terms of duplexing, you didn't need anywhere near the level of duplexing you need today in solid state equipment to, uh, you know, achieve a 600 megahertz split, excuse me, 600 kilohertz split. <clears throat> so one of the big east-west divides on this from the way people were doing stuff on the west coast, the way people were doing stuff, and, you know, AWRL was doing stuff on the east coast, was kind of this nature of what the technicians did uh, since they couldn't really go above 147 megahertz. So thus you had two subbands. You had a 146 subband and a 147 subband. Uh, and that's how we have two separate one megahertz repeater bands. Uh, interesting about 147, the top 100 kilohertz of 147 was all uh, repeaters couldn't be there initially. Uh, it wasn't until I believe the 1970s that was cleared up. So this is what the, the two meter band looked like at the time. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the, uh, essentially we had 11 inputs, uh, 11 outputs, some simplex in the middle uh, uh, between both. Uh, and if you were uh, an operator, you decided, well, do I wanna be on 146 with my equipment or do I wanna be on 147? And if you were a technician, well, the choice was easy. You're on 146. Uh, frequency coordination starts around this time, and this is what it looked like up until 1972. <clears throat> so speaking about some of our frequency coverage here and, and some of the interesting things on this, this is showing the, the coverage of a what would be a, a typical radio of the day. Uh, you can see it's got the kind of 250 kilohertz receiver area, but you can wide band that and maybe get 500 out of it if you're lucky with some reduced performance at the edge there. That's where it kind of drops off. And if you want to cover two or three frequencies and then cover some simplex in the middle, well, you got to tune your, your transmitter for the lower portion. You tune your receiver for the upper portion and cut, capture a few of the outputs and then some simplex in the middle. And that's why 146.52 became that kind of national calling frequency. It was the big simplex. And no matter who you were, technician, general, extra, whatever, you could get on there and use it. <clears throat> uh, but this mirrored all the wideband stuff that uh, happened in the commercial world. So getting into the 1970s, there's a big FM boom. This is, you know, 60s are kind of where it cut its teeth. 70s is... This, this is a big deal. This is cool. Um, and, uh, you know, this is around the same time. This is before cell phones, before all that. And, you know, people, I think, even started developing auto patch, which was amazingly cool in its day. So in 1972, you have the first formal repeater regulations that come about from the FCC uh, in, in Part 97, which it became Part 97 at some point back in the 1960s. Before that was Part 12, actually. Uh, the WR call sign. So when you did a repeater application now, you got a call sign assigned to your repeater that just wasn't a random call sign. It was WR, 
wherever the repeater was in the call district, and then a repeater call sign. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally now, the entire repeater subband gets opened up to technicians. Uh, and FM goes all the way to 148 uh, under these new 1972 regulations. So this causes an explosion. And of course, most of the US decides, hey, we're gonna move to a 30 kilohertz channel. We're still gonna do wideband, but it's gonna be 30 kilohertz. Uh, Cali, uh, California actually moved to this in the late 1960s. Commercial users now have been narrow band through several generations of equipment. Fully solid state radios are starting to come out now in the 1970s. <clears throat> and what's kind of cool by the later 1970s, dedicated ham radio gear that supports five kilohertz FM comes out, uh, it synthesized comes out. Uh, Clegg had been making stuff that was crystal controlled early enough and the reason I mentioned Clegg is I actually have a, I picked up a synthesized uh, Clegg radio and uh, at a ham fest for like 20 bucks just as a demonstration when I was giving a talk one day. I said, here's an example of a radio that doesn't do PL and it's, you know, it's 50 years old. <clears throat> so importantly, um, the 145 or 144.5 to 145.5 megahertz uh, band, I'll just call it 145 for simple, uh, is uh, permitted now by the FCC. And this is born narrow band, so you have 20 kilohertz channels day one. Uh, some places did look at going with 15 kilohertz. Uh, when I studied what other states were doing, majority of it is 20 kilohertz. And the FCC finally recognizes in the rules coordination versus non-coordination. So here's what our band looks like now. Um, this is 1972-1978, and <clears throat> you can see there is some narrow band here, uh, but this is uh, this is what's available, and you can see how these were split uh, as well. This is the 1978-1984 band, um, and of course, packet uh, takes off in a big way in the 80s, so that goes in the middle here of this 145 megahertz band. Uh, and, you know, wideband is essentially dying off. Uh, we're, you know, a couple of generations now into surplus narrowband equipment being on the market. And all the wideband stuff is all tube based and people don't want to deal with that anymore. <clears throat> so some areas of the country actually went to the 146 to 148 band and said, hey, we're going to migrate this to 20 kilohertz instead of 30 kilohertz rather than going to 15. Uh, but by and large, most people just split it and went to 15. But Florida did that as well. Uh, there's some real reasons that 20 kilohertz works a whole heck of a lot better. Um, and I'll get into that in a second. So again, uh, approaching the 1980s, FCC re rewrites the repeater rules in 1978. I think they just got tired of dealing with all the applications from, from hams. So they did away with all the repeater licensing, the logging requirements and all that stuff. Uh, any technician now uh, can run one under their own call sign. Just put it up, it's your call sign, you better comply with the rules. Uh, this is also marks a trend where the FCC starts, I think becoming a little less technical as, as time goes on and a little more just legally focused. <clears throat> So commercial VHF by this time is all synthesized radios by the 80s. Uh, there's still crystals. Uh, there's still crystals, especially in base stations, but the, uh, the, the, the tech is coming there to be wider band radios, uh, easier to move around in terms of frequency and fully synthesized. Uh, you start seeing computer programmable radios around this time period from, you know, especially Motorola, Centaur, things like that. GE does the same thing with, uh, with their radios. Um, hams across the nation make a big push to five kilohertz narrow band. Uh, it's just the way to go. Uh, it works just as well, and we can do more, you know, we can get more repeaters in the band. Uh, the success down at 145 shows this works very, very well. And of course, well, the commercial guys have been doing it for years, and it works really well there. So 
several states, like I said, move to this 20 kilohertz spacing above 146. Uh, Florida doesn't. Um, and this really isn't ideal due to these adjacency issues. Even right now when we coordinate on uh, 146 megahertz and above, we have to take into account adjacencies and, and things like that, uh, even for wideband repeaters. <clears throat> Interestingly, the Florida Repeater Council is founded in 1984. That is the, uh, the predecessor to the uh, FASMA, the Florida Spectrum Management Association. So this is the current band plan. We got 73 pairs. Uh, you can see where simplex is in the middle, but it's still three one megahertz subbands. It's not, hey, we got three megahertz of spectrum. Maybe we don't have to use 600 kilohertz. We could do something like one and a half or you know, 1.6 megahertz or something like what we do on 220. And now we only need a two cavity duplex instead of a three cavity or a four cavity versus a six cavity, whatever you want to say. <clears throat> so at the same time, we're getting into the 90s. Uh, the FCC says, hey, uh, narrow band 2.0. We proposed in 1995, or FCC proposes in 1995, all commercial users need to go narrow band. And this is showing the FCC becoming less technical said, let's just take VHF and split it again. It worked before. <laughs> and digital is really not into its own at this time. Uh, the FCC is concentrating really hard on some of the analog technologies that are out there, ultra narrow band analog technology, uh, ACSSB. Uh, they're doing that up on, you know, it was one of the proposals for 220. I'll mention that in a minute. But Digital is not into its own at this point when this, these are written. So this is proposed to go into effect by 2005, but really it takes until 2013. And there's actually some holdouts that go until 2016 uh, under waiver uh, of the rules, not just, <laughs> you know, rural departments that didn't upgrade their stuff. Um, and this is a much longer time frame than narrowband 1.0 took. So the real problem here is these 7.5 kilohertz channels on VHF are too narrow for the 11.2 kilohertz narrow band analog FM. Um, and this is actually true narrow band FM now. Um, <clears throat> and this has less performance than uh, wideband FM by a, a large margin. It has some other issues uh, in terms of uh, sensitivity uh, of the equipment. You lose, you lose about 6 dB when you convert. So you have to run more output power or you have to uh, have more equipment, uh, you know, more receive sites, whatever. Uh, it, it just wasn't as easy as going from white, you know, the 15 to five. This was a big deal for a lot of departments. Uh, interestingly, around the same time, the public safety standards, P25 came about. And, you know, even P25 uh, phase one is 8.1 kilohertz. Uh, and it's too wide to fit in a 7.5 kilohertz you know, uh, uh, channel without bleeding over into adjacent channels. And what's really bad about digital is whether you're talking or not, that signal is always going to be that same width. Analog gets to vary, gets to go in and out a little bit in terms of width uh, uh, on the spectrum. You don't have that with digital. So you just get a higher bit error rate it's not ideal. Um, it made a lot more sense uh, at UHF when they said, well, it's 25 kilohertz. We're going to split it down to 12 and a half. Everybody was happy with that. And it works very well at 12 and a half. Uh, even analog FM fits fine at 12 and a half. Um, and my, my sub uh, subtopic here or uh, subtitle I had was thanks for making the federal government billions out of thin air. That's a direct quote uh, in 1994 or so for, by uh, the vice president, Al Gore at the time, to the, the FCC, who had auctioned off tons of spectrum and plugged numerous holes in the budget and showed that we had this huge surplus. Uh, they were very, very happy about that. So in the same time period, hams lose 220 to 222 for UPS. And they were going to do this amplitude compounded single sideband stuff. Uh, it took so long that they said, 
hey, there's this little company called Fleet Call. Uh, I think they eventually became Nextel. We're just going to go use them and uh, thank you, FCC. We don't have to do any of this stuff because this uh, ACSSB stuff really doesn't work all that well and it's very expensive. So uh, it sat unused. Uh, there was some 220 deployment commercially. Very, very little actually happened. And by and large, there was less use of that band uh, up until uh, recently uh, than hams uh, had on it. So they took it from actually, even though it was lightly used by amateurs, it was still used to uh, sitting dormant for the better part of uh, three decades. Uh, interestingly enough, right now it's used for something called positive train control. Uh, I don't know much about trains, but I, I know it has something to do with uh, train crossings and, and things like that. Uh, and and that's, that's what it's being used for right now. Uh, at least it's got a use. But one of the good things that did come out of this was, hey, we have some standards now. What are we looking for in terms of spectral efficiency? Uh, just under one bits per hertz of occupied spectrum or one voice path per 12 and a half kilohertz is what the FCC said. This is what you need to have as a minimum. Um, digital makes sense for narrowband, but perhaps not in a trunking environment. And a lot of the big public safety stuff is going from single channel right now to trunking systems. Uh, all the popular standards are greater than seven and a half kilohertz. Uh, of course, trunking isn't really happening that much on VHF, um, but you know DMR uh, P25 Phase Two have two voice paths in a single, you know, 12 and a half kilohertz carrier. Um, Tetra, which is popular in Europe, uh, it's kind of their version of P25, has four in a 25 kilohertz, you know, channel or 22 kilohertz bandwidth, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, trunking sites, though, makes a lot of sense actually to start looking at Tetra or these, these two time slot things, you need less combining equipment because you need a combiner per carrier versus uh, if that carrier is doing four voice channels versus one, uh, say in the case of NXDN or something like that. Um, I believe had the FCC studied this at VHF, I mean, if they had just moved to maybe a more logical channel spacing at 7.5 kilohertz, uh, they certainly had the power. Everybody was having to relicense and move stuff anyways. They could have went from 15 kilohertz down to 10 kilohertz channels and still would have got a lot more space in the spectrum uh, and more users to it. Uh, and, and it would have performed a whole heck of a lot better, I think. <clears throat> now, this is the important point. There's no intent to force any ham activity to 7.5 kilohertz channels. Absolutely none. It's supported. Uh, you can coordinate a seven and a half kilohertz channel. Happy to do so, but no, no nobody's forcing anybody to go narrow band. Uh, interestingly enough, though, uh, the UK two meter band, which is only one forty four to one forty six, they only have two megahertz there, um, uses a twelve point five kilohertz channel spacing, uh, very similar to UHF, and it's one hundred percent narrow band. But uh, they only have, uh, I believe, like. 13 or 14 repeater pairs. It's it's a lot more regimented there because they just simply, you know, we start looking at it, it's like, well, man, they, they only have a few more repeater pairs than maybe GMRS has. Uh, so it's, it's very hard to coordinate there and they've made pretty good use of it. So looking forward, we're getting towards uh, the end of this year. I think this is going to be one of these uh, hour and 15 minute presentations I do. I apologize for that. So the whole point of this study is to say, how can we better plan and, and better do things here in Florida? And in VHF, again, focusing on two meters, most ham repeaters are not going narrowband, even on UHF. If it's analog, it's wideband. There's no reason that hams are going to go narrowband, um, <clears throat> excluding digital, which 99.9% .9 of digital repeaters are going narrowband. DMR is huge in the state of Florida. Uh, behind that is uh, Yezu System Fusion, P25, uh, Phase 1 is big as well. All those are narrow band possible. Um, and the problem is I think most people that get the Fusion repeater end up running it as just a, a wideband FM repeater. So moving to 7.5 kilohertz isn't going to give us any, you know, it's, it's not going to give us any more channels. Uh, 
as I said, if you want one, we can get you one now. Uh, the fact of the matter is, with the exception of D-Star and NXDN, nothing fits in it. Uh, 145 uh, megahertz subband is 20 and 10 kilohertz right now for you know, wideband and narrowband respectively. Digital really works well on 10 kilohertz. Uh, in some cases, we can put a, a digital station uh, reasonably close to another wideband user and we have no issues with it. So uh, FASMA, again, we have no intent to push anyone narrowband. Uh, however, if you get a digital only repeater, we're not going to give you a wideband only channel. Uh, we have several people, oh, you know, I want to keep my wideband channel. Well, yeah, but you're running a two time slot DMR repeater. It, uh, it's linked on Brandmeister. It's, it's never going to go analog ever again. Um, the nice thing about this, though, is we can pretty easily find narrowband channels. <clears throat> so some of our current study areas and the reason we put this whole thing together to figure out where we're going is, hey, there's packet. We have 200 kilohertz of spectrum for packet available. Is it being used? Uh, FM simplex. There's over 400 kilohertz just set aside for FM simplex. That is a ton of, you know, you know, simplex. Uh, I think I'll, I don't know that all of it is currently used. Um, and then the other thing, there's some unused. There's about 500 kilohertz of spectrum sitting on the band right now that is either dedicated for experimental or this, what's called this future Oscar use. Uh, this was something kind of dreamed up by the ARRL back in the, um, the 70s. And uh, I've corresponded with our uh, AMSAT here and the European uh, equivalent thereof of AMSAT. I forget what it is off the top of my head. Uh, and they have no intent to actually, <coughs> excuse me, they have no intent to actually use this spectrum. And in monitoring the, the spectrum that's there, we found uh, this experimental stuff is, you know, essentially people using it as either simplex or remote base kind of stuff on two meters. Uh, weak signal use, uh, again, uh, the first 100 kilohertz of the, the band, 144, 144.1, that's going to be CW only by, uh, you know, uh, FCC rules. The next couple hundred kilohertz there is single sideband propagation. That's There's actually a lot of SSV activity in, in Florida on two meters. I was kind of surprised monitoring. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, unless they need more space, uh, and I, I really don't think they do, it's a, you know, it's a handful of people and it's pretty well confined as to where it's at. Um, you know, but if somebody says we need more space for weak signal, you know, that's maybe something we can look at too. So we need input from all the two meter users in Florida. If you're a ham and you use two meters in Florida, we got to make the best use of the bands that we have. Uh, if we don't, we'll lose them. Uh, we've lost a ton of spectrum in the last few years. Um, and uh, I mean, several hundred megahertz of spectrum we've lost in the last few years, mostly in the microwave bands. Uh, but uh, you know, I take the view as somebody that was operating in those bands, that's important to me. And the ARRL kind of said, well, eh, it was bound to happen. And, you know, I think that's kind of a defeatist attitude. So what we put together was a, a pretty detailed survey here. Um, you have to register for it. Uh, it's so we can, you can get your email in there. We basically want to make certain that uh, people aren't taking it, you know, multiple times. You can log in and, you know, change your answers if you want as well. Um, but this is super important. Uh, and the way it's set up, it will actually say, hey, if you're a user of this particular segment, we're going to ask you questions about. You know, if you're not, you can click no and it'll move on. Uh, that's one of the reasons we're hosting it on our own servers, uh, using our own application to do it rather than doing it through something like, uh, you know, Google, uh, which makes it very hard to actually, it's impossible to do that sort of survey with it. Um, the intent is for this to run kind of through the, you know, this first half of the year, uh, and then we'll take it, crunch the numbers from it and publish some, some data on, you know, what people are actually using two meters for in Florida. Uh, we also have a discussion list set up for, you know, call it the FASMA public, uh, mailing list. Um, there's a, a link there where you can go sign up for it. 
Uh, we're not signing anybody up to that automatically or anything like that. Uh, if you want to get on it, you can get on it, and uh, it's a public, you know, unmoderated uh, discussion list. So my recap and my parting thoughts here is two meters, if you can take one thing away from this, it's two meters is really three one megahertz bands. So we have the 145, 146, and 147 megahertz bands. We don't have three megahertz of spectrum. Our 15 kilohertz channel width is just intertwined with commercial operations. 600 kilohertz offset, well, this is due to those three one megahertz bands. It gives you inputs at the bottom or the top and outputs at the bottom or the top. And you got a couple hundred kilohertz in the middle. That's uh, going to be your, um, <clears throat> your simplex uh, or packet radio in the case of uh, 145 megahertz. And a lot of early missteps, uh, just, you know, a lot of the stuff was done before people understood the problems we were going to face. And so, well, you know, this, this VHF stuff barely even works and people are making regulations for it. Uh, so we're living with that today. Uh, UHF 220, uh, even 50 megahertz makes a lot more sense in terms of the way it's laid out for repeater operation. Uh, and FM operation. Um, and we really do benefit from having close commercial bands. You look at the amount of equipment we have available because we have a commercial band all the way at, you know, at 150 and we're down at, you know, 146. You look at 220, for example, there's very little 220 equipment out there because there's nothing really commercially around it. So nobody's going to make something there. Uh, they also say, well, it's a, it's a U.S. only band, or it's a it's a, really a Region Two only band. Um, so that's you know that's one of the reasons. It's a and in a lot of cases, chicken and the egg problem. And the big thing is, we want to hear from you. So we have the survey again. Please go there, sign up, let people know about it. If you're a ham, if you're in Florida, if you're using two meters, sign up, take the survey, uh, please. I. I really want to get that information uh, uh, back from the community. So thanks for sitting through all this. I have a couple other slides I'll go through just uh, uh, kind of the backup. Uh, it was uh, a pullout of the <clears throat> timeline from the research paper. And I think some of this is kind of interesting, but it's here. You can pause this and go through it. So these are what I call the two-way milestones, 1927, 1939. The, the one I pull out on here that I really like is uh, FCC formally establishes the two and a quarter meter and one and a, or two and a half and the one and a quarter bands uh, by uh, decision. Uh, that wasn't there initially. We just kind of tuned all over the place. <clears throat> Nineteen forty to nineteen fifty four. Um, again, nineteen forty one, December eighth. Hams get chased off the air because of World War Two. Uh, rightfully so, I think at the time it it was an existential threat to the to the U.S. and kind of struck us out of the middle of nowhere. Um, and a sad note: nineteen fifty four, um, uh, Armstrong uh, commits suicide over years of litigation regarding the FM patents. Uh, that was really Kind of a sad thing. Uh, it was brilliant, uh, going in person, kind of uh, chewed up by the court system, unfortunately. So, uh, in uh, 1955, we had narrow band 1.0. Uh, they moved to five kilohertz, uh, and that was November 1st, 1963. Everything that was wide band was dead. Uh, first mention of uh, FM repeaters, uh, or well, FM and repeaters, uh, published by uh, James uh, um, <clears throat> uh, Aragard and uh, W6FNO uh, on the West Coast published about uh, FM. Uh, 1967, Motorola was denied appeal uh, for the Armstrong patents after uh, 19 years. <clears throat> and then uh, just a couple things here on this, a uh, whole bunch of interesting things here. I dislike the fact we lost 220, but uh, the Florida Repeater Council was founded in 1984. And finally in 2017, FASMA was founded and 
the repeater console trans results duties to FASMA as of uh, uh, December of that year. So that's uh, just some interesting history. I thought it's, it's kind of a cool thing. Um, go back. So anyways, uh, thanks again for this. I'm just going to put this back up here so you have it. I'm also going to put it in the link below. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate everybody kind of sitting through this. And if you have any questions, uh, please reach out. We have the mailing list. We have, uh, again, the survey. Uh, you can always hit me up at uh, thefields at fastma.org. <clears throat> and uh, we are working through our coordinations and everything right now. And, and that's, you know, coming along. So um, uh, I hope, uh, uh, hope people found this was informative. And if there's anything wrong or incorrect in here, please, please, again, reach out to me. So uh, <clears throat> I really, uh, again, uh, appreciate the time you take uh, in, uh, you know, uh, this presentation and watching it. So uh, thank you very much. This is uh, Brian Fields, Amateur Radio Call Sign W9CR.